the, okay, so the NDP said nothing other than like, fuck him ass. That was like the line. Fuck him ass, fuck him ass. I'm like, whoa, that fuck, deep shit, guys. Like, no yeah, kidding. That's right. Like, yeah. whoa, whoa, you must have had a team of 10 people come up with that message. Fuck him ass. Okay, great. All right. Hi, and welcome to uh, the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Nora Loretto, uh, terrorist of the left in Canada. <laughs> God, I wish. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So uh, I guess, as always, uh, I've had you on the show before, but in case, I've, for new subscribers, who are you? Um, I'm a writer. Mostly I write stuff and, uh, and I am a political organizer as well. And, um, most of my political organizing is with unions and skills-based organizing. Um, but I also, uh, do a lot of other stuff in my community and I write books and I write articles and I, um, I seem to not have, uh, like run out of things to say. So I've just, I'm always saying different stuff in different places. For sure. Yeah. Like, uh, You've been on like uh, the Canada Land podcast, which is like a big, big deal these days. And mm-hmm. uh, you have your own podcast, which is very successful. And one mm-hmm. of my favorite shows, actually, like I actually listen to it every time it comes out. <laughs> Even <Amazing>. the daily news. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and sorry, I'm going to be eating lunch because this is what my life is like. Yeah, the daily news is like, I got a daily podcast, folks. You want seven to 10 minutes of an injection of news every morning? Especially if you're further west in the Eastern time zone, it'll be there when you wake up. Sandyhammer.com. Yeah. yeah, it's a uh, uh, it's nice because you cover things in a, a different way than you might get from like uh, uh, CBC or what have you. And it's it's short and pithy, but with uh, your perspective, which is from a leftist perspective, mm-hmm. I like that. <laughs> it's quite a bit better than uh, I used to listen to, like the Daily Zeitgeist which was like oh, yeah. an hour and a half, two hours every morning. And you go, well, I no longer have time for that every day. <laughs> like, it's just too much. But I mean, do you know what the word zeitgeist is, guys? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess uh, I've already mentioned that you're on the left, but do you have a specific political ideology that you follow? Um, that's a good idea. A good question. Um, I describe myself as a socialist. I would say that I, I believe in, um, in, 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 you know, the democratic control of, of workplaces and governments being formed out of that democratic control. Um, I'm not a member of a socialist organization, which of course is like a a cardinal sin of being a socialist to not actually be a member of a socialist organization. Um, but I'm also not like, I'm not firmly ideological. And so I, I find a lot of inspiration in um, pretty much all tendencies of left-wing thought, except social democracy, if we can call it that. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and so I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to anarchism and, uh, and anarcho-syndicalism and, you know, just other ways the that union we can one. <laughs> The <laughs> union one, exactly. And just other ways that we can organize society that brings power back to people and, and, and to express like a, a pure democracy, a kind of democracy that we've never, we've never had, you know, just like we've never had pure socialism. It's like, folks, we've never actually had democracy either. So right, yeah. let's be clear. Yeah. Like the idea of uh, representative democracy. I often like, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me that we just put these people up here for four years and they're just allowed to do whatever they want. <laughs> and yeah. our only re- repercussion is to maybe vote against them next time. Mm-hmm. Nonsense. Yeah, I think that like the most interesting political st- uh, system, uh, like in the, in the parameters of what we have right now, would be sortition, where we like randomly select our government officials every four oh, years. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I, I think that that's <laughs> really interesting because that would force um, all political tendencies to be doing the, the grassroots work, you know. Yeah, the educational sure that, level, and yeah. Yeah, that you're influencing people that would be randomly selected to be in parliament. So. Anyway, I think sortition is cool. There's not enough people that say that. So there you go. It's interesting. I guess yeah, no, a sortition is. <laughs> nice. Um, so I guess, how does being so a socialist like manifest in your life? 
Hmm. Well, um, I give my kids too much power to make decisions. That's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, I do that myself. <laughs> you know, although I'm not totally socialist with my kids because, of course, socialism is not about how you parent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, how do I see that in my life? I mean, I, I'm, I'm always fighting to make sure that people have the education that they need and the, and the analyses that they need to understand power so yeah. that they can build the power themselves. You know, there's some really interesting uh, debates going on right now around privatization because privatization is destroying a lot. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell people that listen to the podcast, but when privatization is bad, and public control is good, which is, you know, ideologically, theoretically true. Uh, but you look at the public system and it's falling apart and people are burnt out right. and people aren't paid enough and it's it's not meeting people's needs. Uh, all of a sudden, you have this like practical problem where maybe what we need to protect or to help or to, to save, uh, you know, certain elements of, of healthcare or education is self-organizing, is organizing through unions, is organizing through communities, and mm -hmm. um, and and trying to to use tenets of socialism to remind people that the system that we have is is bad. It's very very bad, and it cannot be reformed. And you know, if a if a clinic, this is a real example. If a clinic is is opened in in my city, and I'm pointing down to where it is, and it's a private clinic because that was the only way for activists to form a health clinic to serve street level work, uh, folks, sex workers, uh, drug uh, drug right. uh, users. I'm not going to be opposed to that because it's private, right? That's the right. that's the model that fits into the system, and it's it's an amazing model. And actually, in their case, it became public because it was such uh, it was such a successful model. So the government did fund it eventually. Right. So, that's kind of like uh, like the harm reduction center in Saskatoon, or like or the yeah. Right. They you could go there. It was a private sort of deal. They had to go get donations and whatnot to even develop it. Mm -hmm. There was no mm -hmm. public money for it. <laughs> no. And so I see those kinds of manifestations of power, of popular power, of fighting against what's wrong with the system as being one expression of how socialism could work or does work or should work. And, um, and so for me, that's very, very important. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, unions, and especially in communications, to try and demystify the whole professional communications world to get yeah. like average, average workers, average union representatives to be able to go toe to toe with the PR companies that are representing their employer. Right. right. And I think that's yeah. really important too. And I mean, sure. I'm not explicitly talking about socialism with them. I mean, I do actually all the time say I'm a socialist and it's not weird. And actually it's the only, it's the only option. <laughs> right. Um, but, um, but it is about building worker power and, and, you know, like workers are not inherently like there were good analyses, as we all know, right? right? It right. takes it takes it takes consciousness building, and it takes education, and it takes solidarity um, building, and in the practice of solidarity. And anything that I can do to to um, enable those groups of people to become more sophisticated and more organized, I see as being part of the expression of my socialist politics. And then, yeah. of course, my books. I mean, you can read my books; they're pretty. They're pretty <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um. So I guess. If somebody doesn't know anything about socialism, mm -hmm. what do you tell them about it? Hmm. I love that question. Um, I love that question more. Like, what do you tell someone who thinks they know about socialism? Right. But I'll start yeah, with someone that right. doesn't know anything about socialism. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we live in a society where relationships uh, all pass through the question of power. What is my power relationship to, um, to my workplace, my community, my neighbors, my family, right? Power is very, very important. And for me, socialism is building power within the, the centers of where the action is happening. So it isn't left-wing politics policies from a Western democratic state. It's literally giving like, like the, the workplace, the community center, the neighborhood, the, the, the democratic tools to then make their own decisions. Right. And that those decisions, you know, maybe you create different kinds of structures, maybe it's a collective, maybe it's delegated authority, whatever. But like the, 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 the problems that we face in society, the people touched most by those problems are the people who need to be most involved in solving those problems. And for me, that is socialism at its base. 
then we can talk about how you build it out and and how you and how you um, are able to create structures that could run a waterworks facility or a utility or whatever through a socialist model. And then you might have things looking like cooperatives or, or democratically right, right. controlled, whatever. Um, but, you know, we designing a system is very silly. And there are lots of interesting models around the world. There's lots of interesting models throughout history. Um, I, I'm not one of these kinds of people that says we need to just do that necessarily right, because right. because I you know why would we do that we can do lots of different interesting things but I think socialism for me and this is my answer to someone who thinks they know socialism and they're like oh socialism never worked it's like socialism is literally the only parts of democracy that are good <laughs> <laughs> right, like yeah, I don't right. know what to tell you but literally anything that we point to and say that is good has socialist roots in it and it's like yeah. you can you know you can say like in capitalism that like okay well people were competing um with each other and the competition created this like really great thing and you could be like okay like Maybe. yeah capitalism <laughs> might produce that in those very specific situations um but social the the, in, the influence on so in, in socialism in everything about our our lives now is actually so often what we would just call democracy um, right, right. If if you're being a little political illiterate, politically illiterate about it, and I think that that's <laughs> the most basic way to talk about it. Um, it's not just making democracy better, but it's like literally the principles underpinning what democracy is: that we control our workplaces, we control our communities, we make the decisions that affect us the most. Yeah, like I, I often think of it in, in terms of like uh, the American uh, bill, of, like Constitution and Declaration of Independence, right? Like they, we the people, except mm -hmm. they meant them, the rich people who own land. But when I think mm -hmm. of we the people, like that's what I mean is like everybody, not just mm -hmm. these elites or just politicians or what have you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what are some good criticisms of socialism? I mean, other than me, <laughs> like you've met some socialists, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's right. yeah. That's right. Well, I mean, this is where we get into cosplaying and dogmatism and, and, and stuff that is, like, frankly, not serious. Um, mm. And I have a lot of respect for people uh, who do, um, who try to build socialist organizations and who do that um, through various means and through building power within, you know, communities or within their workplaces or socialists who get involved in their union and try to, you know, make their union do good things. Right. Um, but I think that. I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding of what socialism is, which is a huge problem and it's a, and it's a liability as well for socialists because, you know, I remember, I won't name names, but I remember I was at um, a situation of a political party where a leader candidate was, was, was running and they were running on a, on a can on a platform of being socialist or being more socialist or something. I don't know. Okay. And, uh, and it was not someone who was formed in socialist politics. Like this was someone who very, over the course of their political life, really moved to the left, realizing that this was like their, our only hope. So, you know, formed formed the analysis in a very um, grassroots uh, way, right? A way that we want, like not necessarily, like not reading Marx all the fucking time. <laughs> right. And their response to someone saying, well, what is socialism to you? Um, was like totally like not socialism at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was just like, it was just like better, better democracy, right? Uh, better, better social safety nets or <laughs> better capitalist democracy like with no, with yeah. no like not talking about like the control of power and this kind of thing but just being like oh well it's you know taking like reigning in corporations and and stuff that's totally totally good but it's like not actually socialism not actually so, yeah uh, so one of my criticisms of course is that that we don't really know what socialism is and people throw it around a lot and i blame a lot of folks who have like any faith in the ndp being socialist uh, like right making socialist be something socialism be something it's not you know that's not a socialist party it cannot be a socialist party it would need to be dynamited and rebuilt from the ground <laughs> to be turned into a socialist party and even when it was founded it was like socialist adjacent right right there yeah. were socialists involved in it they're, they're part they're, they're like the ccf like it was radical but it's not a socialist party like in the same way that quebec solidaire tons of socialists in it it's not a socialist party it's still a right. party operating in western capitalist democracy um it's not a dead end to do that kind of work 
But we have to be very clear that that is not what socialism is. Socialism right. is far outside of the structures that we that we currently kind of are all bound by. And socialists are not very good at explaining that. And as I say, I Fair. think it's because a lot of people who would say they're socialist don't actually know what socialism is, <laughs> which is also fine. I mean, sure. As yeah. well, if the word's out there, then <laughs> I guess it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. And then you can get into like discussions about, well, socialism or communism, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, communism is like one of the ways that socialism has been turned into a government system, right? We can, we can learn a lot of things from communism and, 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 you know, I say I'm a socialist because I, 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 I think that matches closer with where my mind's at. I very easily could say I'm a communist um, right. But it's hard because I'm not a member of the Communist Party. I don't think that the current right. Communist Party in Canada really has like what it takes, you know. So then you're getting into like again, partisan. I mean, we can call right, it uh, right. factionalism, but yeah, sectarianism. It, sectarianism. <laughs> it's you know, but it's and that and that's really where socialists get a little bit like they're smelling their farts too much, and it's like yeah. you guys, like we need to fucking get like some oxygen. And remind ourselves that like, you know, we, we build, and everybody is often, people who are serious are doing this, but you have to build the power, physically build that power in real life spaces. Yeah, for sure. I think sometimes it's easy for us, like the whole, the echo chamber thing. It's easy to forget yeah. when we're talking to other socialists that we're actually a very small group of people yeah. <laughs> and we have to like really get into touch with like more people just to, to even broaden our numbers. So. Oh my God, totally. And then this is where like, when I'm talking to people about politics, I always say I'm a socialist. Literally, like I, I was covering the convention at the, like the conservative party convention as a right. journalist. And they'd always ask, well, what's your, what are your politics? And I'm like, oh, me, I'm a socialist. And they'd right. be like, oh, you're a what? Right. It's like, <laughs> I, I have nothing to hide. And you want to talk about politics, we can talk about politics. But it's just like the, the normalization of that. It's like, no, no, I'm 100% fully a socialist. And let, we can talk about that if you'd like, but For you sure. you ask my politics and there they are. And I'm asking your politics and I'm writing them down and putting them in an article. So Right. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me of, because uh, I use the terms, like I, I call myself an anarcho-communist. So then I, I call, I say I'm a communist. I say I'm an anarchist. I say I'm a socialist. Yeah. I, I just throw it all out there. And uh, right. I had a former manager. He thought I was a liberal. Right. <laughs> so he starts talking shit about Justin Trudeau. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I'm a communist. Yeah. Like you can't insult less. me by by insulting Justin Trudeau. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, can you insult him better? Because you're boring me. Yeah, because actually, you're kind of wrong about the things you're saying. So <laughs> let let's get it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I guess that uh, my my next question uh, kind of incorporates that same thing. Like, what might you say to someone to convince them that you are following the correct ideology? But that's sort of the same um, like thing. Like someone on the left? Like it, it would also depend on the work that they're doing. Right. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what you call yourself. Are you doing good work? Right. right. And and I mean, I'm not going to tell someone who's like who's like a different tendency than I might think is right uh, that they're wrong because who cares? So that's, again, we're going back to cosplaying. Like what right. materially are we talking about here? What are the differences do you, you know, and this, this comes up all the time, actually, when we're talking about communists in Quebec, where communists in Quebec have traditionally been federalists, right? Okay. And then it's like, there's no federalist defense to maintaining the Canadian state. Like, there's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know? And so yeah. that, that's a fun debate, because then you get, like, communists that will argue, well, you know, Quebec doesn't have claim to its to its territory. It's why why would they become independent? But it's like, no, no. Give me a progressive argument in favor of the federation. Try right, yeah. you know. And sometimes someone might come up with, I mean, rarely, but sometimes someone might come up with, well, it pools our resources together. It's more efficient to run that kind of thing, right? Which is like, I mean, that's maybe it, I'm sure maybe <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe. Um, but, uh, but those kinds of debates I think are actually really, really important. And, and, and where, where on the question of like what tendency of socialism or, or flavor of socialism are you, I'm kind of like, don't care. Um, right. if you're going to tell me that a left wing future in Canada is the a United Canada, it's like, no, no, you're fucking wrong. And I'm going to tell yeah. you why you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, <laughs> yeah, not, not, it's not going to be Canada anymore. Is what no, is. no. It I mean, can't. like, sorry, what? <laughs> like, yeah, it can't be. It can't be. There's literally nothing about this country that can be salvaged that's any good. So do I want to yeah. be part of a, of a nation building project in another part of this country? Or do I want to try and save Canada from being like 
shitty. Uh, I, I know what I'd, re- I'd rather do, but right. that's because I come from a place with culture, which not every Canadian can say. No, I, uh, I, I don't know that I can say that. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> like, as much what, as what's I our culture? Love, like, <laughs> as much as I love Saskatchewan, I remember being in a car with like a full car and we were driving south from, uh, from, uh, probably from La Ronge. We were further north than La Ronge. And um, this conversation came up with what is Canadian culture and everyone is from uh, Saskatoon except for me. And uh, literally they're just like, yeah, we, we have nothing. We can't give you anything. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I know that, but I just like hearing you try. <laughs> We we uh, we have our own language. We use grid bunny roads, hugs, bunny and hugs, bunny hugs. Go watch, go watch. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, guys. Sure. Yeah, that's right. And there's an accent. I mean, for sure, it's cute. Sure, like, sure. Come on. <laughs> uh, so I guess my my next question. We kind of mentioned the NDP and how they're not socialists. <laughs> so uh, I recently was having a conversation with a friend and. And he said, like, how revolutionary would it be if the NDP got a majority government? And I said, it wouldn't be. <laughs> so why is the NDP not the revolutionary radical next step? Yeah, so the NDP at its best is a reform movement at its best, right? right. And just like labor. I mean, labor is not radical either. Um, and what does that mean? It means that the party has a vision of Canada that is like tinkered with to be better, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. That and, and the tinkering would help a lot of people, right? Like pouring investments into healthcare and education and um, improving a lot of things that like Trudeau is bad on, whatever, right? Like, like tinkering is not bad, the worst thing. It's, it's right, fine, right? right? Oh, fine, okay. <laughs> but there's nothing revolutionary about saying, if you elect me, I'm going to give double the money to healthcare. Right. That's, that's not revolutionary. That's like, no. first of all, they're not even saying that. They would never say that. <laughs> they, would, they would give them maybe 10% more, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. They would never go that far even. <laughs> no. And, and, you know, you have to step back and say, well, who runs this country? It's the banks, the telecoms, the energy industry. You know, yeah. is the NDP going to change the material relationship with any of these groups? Obviously not. We know that they're not. They didn't in British Columbia. They're absolutely not going to do it in Manitoba. They never have done in any provincial um, uh, election after that they've won. They're not changing that that relationship. And that would be a break with the status quo that is like intense and that would be shocking. And right. the NDP would never, ever, ever, ever do that. They would never say that they're going to do it and they would never do it. Will they try to tax, you know, billionaires marginally more? Sure. Great. You know, <laughs> but, but yeah. it, it's, it, you know, but, but there's nothing at all that is revolutionary about this party. Like not even, I mean, Christ, <laughs> like, it, like, it's like asking if a fucking baby could fly. No, baby can't fly. Why can't this baby fly? <laughs> That's it, yeah. it, it, it literally cannot fly. It doesn't have wings. It was never made to have wings. It's a baby. It's not a bird. Right. So yeah. that that's where the NDP is, and the problem is that uh, they, you know, the left in Canada is so weak that if you're looking for what is my what is the path of least resistance from where I am to power, and it's because mm-hmm. I want to influence power for good. Let's say, right. You're gonna see the NDP as your only option if you're on the left. Yeah. And there's there's folly in that because, but the fuck like <laughs> no no radical person that's ever been in any of those positions has done fuck all, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's so so yeah, it's not revolutionary. It's it's extraordinarily reformist, and over the decades, it's become less and less reformist, like much more. Right, right. We're yeah. better than them. We're, it's like we're the liberals, policy. but not. <laughs> but well, and then in Ottawa, they basically are the liberals. They're propping the liberals up, right? So it's yeah. like, you know, the, the, their idea of reform has even has even um, mellowed significantly in the last four years. Yeah, we. Uh, I was talking to an old anarchist uh, in uh, here in Regina, and like I said, so like, what happened here? Like, why can't I find any radical movements in this province? <laughs> and he goes, well. The NDP back in the day took all the wind out of everybody's sails yeah. and took all the energy, and that's where everybody thinks the energy yeah. needs to go. So, yeah. So and, and then they keep pulling right. So <laughs> yeah, and Saskatchewan's a really great example because, like, 
You know, Tommy Douglas's government, when he was first elected in the 40s, uh, was like, I mean, I don't think you could say they were radical in that they were trying to change the structures of the province. They were certainly a radical break from what had been the status quo. Right. You know, and, and, but, but they were still reformists and they were still always fighting within the party. How far do we push? How far don't we push? Um, you know, uh, Charles Smith, who I'm sure, you know, does amazing research, uh, at, uh, up in Saskatoon. And, and he, he looks at, um, or he makes a point that when they were first election in, elected in like what, 1942 or 1943, um, there was a lot of work done by Ontarians who are members of the party to try and use Saskatchewan as the proof that they could govern Ontario. And so, uh-huh. you know, there, there, there was radicalism in a lot of what they were doing. I mean, stuff that you couldn't imagine any government doing today. But again, it was still like to maintain a white Christian Canada, to maintain right. the kind of Canada that, that that people maybe aspired to see. So, you know, th- that's the foundations of the NDP. Now, if the NDP, the federal NDP went back to the politics of Tommy Douglas, I mean, I'd be like, whoa, okay. Like still, still not, <laughs> it would seem it's not, radical. <laughs> yeah, it's not a socialist revolution, but I mean, well, it's pretty good, right? But again, yeah. we're like, we're you know, we're 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 in another universe from where the NDP was back then. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I was uh, even. I guess it kind of manifested even like recently in the in the way that the uh, the one member of the NDP made a statement about uh, Israel Palestine issues, and the yeah. federal NDP was like. She does not represent our views. <laughs> yeah, that and that is like so stupid. Like so stupid <laughs> on seventeen different levels. So you know, you had the end. The, okay, so the NDP said nothing other than like "fuck a mass." That was like the line: "fuck a mass, fuck a mass." Like, whoa, that fuck, deep shit, guys. Like, no yeah, kidding. That's right. Like, yeah. Whoa, whoa! You must have had a team of ten people come up with that message. Fuck well, a mass. Okay, great. <laughs> so no one else seemed to be allowed to comment because when I recorded my podcast on Monday, because we went through all of the comments that politicians had made, uh, and the podcast came out yesterday, we we're like, no one has said anything in the NDP at that point. Right. So the federal party puts out a statement, and the statement is like better than it's than you would expect. Better than it can, pretty much has been ever. Uh, Palestinian activists have been fighting for years to make that party better. So it's not surprising. Um, and then Sarah Jama comes up with this statement in Ontario and the statement is like, it's like a condensed undergraduate essay, right? right. It's like, it's like, it's like referenced and cited and, and good. <laughs> like nothing she says <laughs> thoughtful is wrong and, and yeah. thoughtful, <laughs> short, right. Uh, but longer than, well, and, um, and yeah, Merritt Stiles, the um, uh, uh, head of the NDP in Ontario, was like, um, she must retract this. And it's like, how would she do that, Merritt? She just put this out. What's she going to say? Oh, I, in footnoting yeah. the research of Professor so-and-so, I fucked up. Like, no, like, you know, you're you're throwing under the, I, I, again, I mean, Sarah, Sarah's gone through this before at the party. You're throwing right. under the bus, like, like a, a black Muslim disabled member of provincial parliament for for writing something that is 100% consistent with what she has said and got got elected saying yeah and yeah. that is like also not bad right. <laughs> so yeah you know like they have no idea they have no idea and the um the the fidelity that they have to capital has completely warped their knowledge of the role of a left wing party um and and that was no more on display than during the whole Nazi stuff a couple of weeks ago, where oh, not yeah, even yeah. not even NDP members sat. Right? Yeah, it's been and, a busy couple of weeks. I forgot I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so like not not I I don't know. Like I'm I'm a thinking person, so I don't know what it is like to be an unthinking person. But if right. I was sitting in a space and I heard someone introduce this guy uh, as as someone fighting fighting against Russia in World War II to liberate Ukraine, I'd be like. Uh, I'm not going to jump my, yeah, not jump into my feet right now. I'm going to be like, what? Yeah. That seems weird. You know, not, oh yes. And then, and he's fine. He fights for veteran. No, I'm not jumping my feet for that. Fuck that actually. Yeah. So um, the NDP was nowhere in that stuff at all. Mm-hmm. And it was like, again, this is, this is fascism, right? Like pure yeah. The definition of fascism from 80 fucking years ago and the NDP, the NDP doesn't have a single member of parliament who's not like, 
<laughs> well, I'm not standing for that. Yeah, let's not stand for this. But like, get out of here. Like, that's that's embarrassing, and that's just that's just de- demonstrative of where where the party's at. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that whole thing. Like, it just go like. Uh, uh, my, I guess my buddy, Justin, he says like, that's the problem with nationalism. Like you, you can hate Russia now and like, maybe you have good reasons for that or whatever, but that has nothing to do with like, they were our ally in world war two, like the fighting against the Nazis. Like if you just hate Russia because Russia exists, then that's pretty fucked up. Like, yeah. Then you got a fucking problem. Like what the fuck's your problem? You hate Russia. Bizarre. Okay. It's totally, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a sign of the times and it infects everything and, um, and it infects the, the, you know, the parliamentary left and it's embarrassing and they take up space and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So I guess, <laughs> uh, if one believes in electoralism, is there a better way, a better party than the NDP or is there a way to improve the NDP? Uh, there is a better party than the NDP. It doesn't exist in anywhere else but Quebec and it's Quebec's leader. Um, okay. you know, they're, they, they still have very good, uh, policies, policies that are not, um, as reformist as what the NDP has accepted. Um, they're still more democratic than any other, uh, political party in Canada. Like getting access to conventions is very open. The conventions are still held in like, you know, college gymnasiums right. instead of like, you know, just shit like that. Right. Um, wh- every election, all the party, all the writings come up with their platform priorities and they all get sent to the central or whatever. So you get this like massive platform, which is, you know, very bad for the communications people that work on the campaign, right. but very, <laughs> very important. Right. Yeah. Uh, the party sure. has centralized though, and has professionalized and there's a lot of bad that comes with that. Um, but it's still on another, on another planet away from the NDP in terms of how right. progressive it is. Um, and partly the problem with the NDP is that, um, you know, they block they block good candidates for, for no reason. Right. And so, you know, you just get these like, like homunculi being MPs and a homunculus uh, leader. And he says something stupid and the rest are like, I'm a homunculus. I don't even know what the fuck. <laughs> we can't criticize the leader. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I have no brain. I just exist. Uh, yes. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and the, and the more and more that, that nomination, um, nominations go that way, more and more the party shuts out like, you know, activists. Um, then, then of course you're going to create a whole bunch of people that like, you know, they're not going to step out of line. They're not going to say the wrong thing because they have nothing to say. Um, like Sarah Jam is a, a, an activist, like a proper right. activist. And, um, you know, when she, when she decided to run, she knew that she was trading off some of the activism for the, the suit that she has to wear and whatever, right. but she's rare, right? She's really, really rare. And, um, and there are good people in the party, but if you don't come from struggle, then you don't know how to struggle within a structure like that and not and not have your, your, your head chopped off. Right. 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 So those things all make the NDP way worse. Um, (laughs) it makes it feel, I mean, Jugmeet sucks. Like that was obvious when he was deputy leader of Ontario and I had to work with him and he was a disaster then. And then the party was like, Oh, we won't be done. No, it'll be great. It's like, uh, to shift gears away from the NDP a little bit. Yeah, I, wanted, uh, <laughs> uh, I heard you once on, on your show talk about how uh, even some progressive people are getting the, are dealing with the attacks on trans rights in the wrong way. Mm. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what you mean by that and uh, what would be some suggestions on the right ways to deal with these? Yeah. So the context was like um, how we are forced to respond to every bit of idiocy that comes from the right. Right. And people feel like they have to respond and that, you know, there's a logic to that. That makes sense. You feel like you have to respond. For sure. But, you know, I made, I made those comments and someone was saying to me like, cause well, I was talking about how like the, the pronoun changes and the name changes and how average people not connected to the schools are instantly going to think of legal changes rather than like an informal teacher calling you a different name. And someone was in touch with me saying, well, I'm in the, that world. I am a teacher. And it's obvious that it is not legal. Like, we know that it's not legal. Mm. And, I, and it was like a good example of what, 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 what we were saying, which is that if you're in this world, it is so easy to see the 90% of people who are not 
in this world. Right. Right. <laughs> and if we are doing activism that is too anchored in the world that we're in, then we're doing We're absolutely going to lose average people. Yeah, you know, yeah. like I heard one of my friends said that at her kid's school, kids are changing their names so often that IT has stopped giving out emails based on name. Okay. Okay. Right. And that's just at a public that, school in Ontario. They've, they're wild. changing their pronouns so much that, <laughs> that it's, it's like, whoa. Right. And I can imagine someone hearing that and be like, that's a problem. Like kids shouldn't be able to do that. That's a problem. And I think that this is showing that there's an, an incredible creativity around identity and gender among young people. Right. That um, is, that is amazing. I mean, that there's nothing, you cannot criticize that, that for it sure. might create problems like, oh shit, IT is changing this kid's name for the third there's time. A technical problem. There's a technical <laughs> problem with this, right? And because I'm in this world, I don't have the immediate, this sounds fucked up response that I do think a lot of people will have if they hear that. Right. Right. Yeah. So how do we talk about this stuff with someone who has not only no contact with education, but has no contact with questioning gender? Right. right? It's like, right. what the fuck are you talking about? No one questioned their gender 30 years ago would be the response. Right. Where right? did this come from? All Where of a did this come from? Oh my God, it's fucking, <laughs> everybody's drinking plastic and now the gender's changing. Right? <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, it takes, and, and this is not the job of people who are most impacted. It's not trans people's right. jobs to do this work. And I have to make that very clear, but there is a huge amount of learning that has to happen among a certain generation about where is this coming from? Why are young people fighting against the gender binary? And why is that good and not a sign of, of distress, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't think we're doing that work at all, at all. And partly it's because the attacks are coming so fast and furious that there's just no space to do that work. And that, that's, right. a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a technical problem that we have to deal with on the left. But, you know, it's like gender is fundamental to social control. And of course, the vast majority of people are going to default to n traditional gender thinking, of right. course, because it is so, it's every, every single thing, every box that I'm is everything, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like being surprised that someone would be like anti-capitalism. Oh, that sounds weird, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But we've essentialized it into, you know, this is someone's identity. And if you're opposed to this, then you're transphobic. And there is absolutely transphobia happening. But we have to find ways to talk about this that allows for people to literally start from zero in their learning. Right. Yeah. And, and, and not that we have to hold people's hands and not that we have to give credence to hateful thoughts or hateful people. But I've seen this. I've seen this in my own family and people in a different generation where it's just like they don't get it. Yeah. And they would be happy to get it, <laughs> but they don't. And, um, and, and that's a, it's a huge change. It's a huge change to have kids experimenting with gender in this way. And it's a positive change. And, um, and if we are too, um, focused on the small and the small, these small worlds where this is happening, we're missing a massive, a massive world that is ripe for the picking of the far right, which is exactly what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. 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 It's like, uh, like I, I work with a lot of guys in the oil field in Saskatchewan. <laughs> so yeah. you hear what the reactionaries are saying and they're, and I'm like, and on so like, I have to work with these guys. So I can't just be like, you're a transphobic asshole and, and I'm done with yeah. you. Fuck you I, get out of my lunchroom. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. so I do have to be like, okay, but here's some real facts about this and here's what's really going on. Like, no, yeah. the school in milestone isn't intentionally making your kids change their gender pronouns. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. But, but it's hard. It's hard because it's like, cause it's also something that I think that people who would call themselves an ally don't always know either. Oh yeah, that's right. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like, you know, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You won't want to mess something up. You don't want to, you don't want to like accidentally give credence to a bigoted line or a bigoted True. line of thought or whatever. Um, and so it's like, yeah, you're in, you know, this something I've experienced. Um, 
you know, in the locker room uh, with the sports team and a teacher talks about how many non-binary kids are in the class, a teacher who's on the team and says, it's fucking weird. Right. And it's like, I don't know if they're being transphobic or if they're just like surprised because in their, their teaching career, they've never right. seen this before. Yeah, uh, I don't know what my, my teammates are going to be thinking. And so again, like, what is the way to talk about that yeah. with, yeah. Um, with people that have no, and in this case, I knew the guy was really religious. So like the odds could have been that it was coming from a hateful place. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't stated in a hateful way. It was stated very much like, I, wow, this is just really surprising. And, you know, then it's like, well, it's kind of, you know, like, it's kind of neat, isn't it? That young people can see that, that, that the gender <laughs> yeah, binary is actually right. fucked up, you know? And, and there's other things that we could talk about, like, especially like with, with like, you know, masculine men who are like, whatever. It's like, yeah, who cares? Sorry, why do you care, man? <laughs> you know? I, I often like, because I, uh, I talk, like everybody drives a big truck. And I right. drive a car right. and I always talk about how much I miss my little PT cruiser, but I right. would always get made, uh, other guys would get, make fun of me. And I'm like, I'm not out here trying to prove how tough I am. I'm yeah. just doing my job and I drive a car that gets good gas mileage. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. in, in some ways, I mean, there's, there's ways to subtly kind of undermine the masculine ideal out, out there, but totally. there's, it's, it's. I don't know how much impact it actually ultimately has, but there's just subtle ways in, do in doing some of it. There is. And then, and then there are also structures that are really important that they're engaging in this struggle, like the labor movement, you know, Unifor having a drag mm -hmm. story time at, at, at Canada council. That's a lot of, of men who work in very manly jobs sitting through a drag story time. And yeah. so they've seen it, right. They understand what that is. That's really, really important. And the unions, <laughs> yeah, you know, sure. I know that the union movement is leading the charge against the Mo government in Saskatchewan. That's yeah. wonderful and necessary. Yeah, awesome. yeah. And so, um, you know, th this, this is, this is a, this is a, this is not, this is not the issue. And so we have like, this is a culture war thing as in they're using this issue. This is not the issue. And right. so we have to fight not as if this is the issue but that this is a culture war thing. And I think that activists in Saskatchewan, especially now that the notwithstanding clauses being talked about are doing a good job of that being like, no, this is just an attack on trans youth. This is, this is just cruel. What are you doing? That kind of thing. Yeah. Like that, that's a much more compelling uh, a, a discussion point than like trying to explain why someone might change their pronouns at the age of 14. Cause it's like, uh, you know, then you're getting into <laughs> really technical shit, right. That yeah, not everyone's right. ready for or there. Right. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I, uh, my skeptical background, like I always like try to debunk things. So mm. it's, I'm always stuck. I got stuck on the parental rights thing. Right. And I'm like, okay, but where did that come from and how full of shit is it? And why, well, yeah. how is it being used? So whenever I talk to somebody about that, then I'm like, well, you know, as far as I can tell, that came out of the anti-vax movement and they wanted to not give their kids the polio vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> so how fucked up is that? <laughs> yeah. No, hundred percent. And it's also like, you know, sorry, parental rights. I mean, like I, I am the parent of my kid. Like I yeah. have picked the school they're in. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. What, what rights, what more rights do I being removed from me? Like it doesn't make any sense. And, yeah. uh, and then, and then the other side of all of this, of course, is enforcement. So, and, right. that, and that's also very useful to talk to people who are skeptical where it's like, how would you enforce that? Yeah, like, sorry, right. so you're in a grade nine classroom. Cindy says, you're going to call me Sam now. And the teacher doesn't Just tell refuses? Cindy's parents. <laughs> or no, let's say the teacher doesn't tell Cindy's parents. Sure. Yeah. What, what, what is the process to punishing that teacher? Yeah. You know? There's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. There's, unless you're going to have like narcs in every, like gender narcs in every single classroom. Right. It, you know, or Cindy's parents, what, find out that Cindy's being called Sam at school. And then what happens? The teacher's punished. The teacher, do you, I can't even get the kid, my kid's teachers to fucking respond to my emails when I'm like, my kid's failing. I need to talk to you. As right. if they have any time to be like, uh, just so you know, uh, Cindy wants to go by Sam and I need your permission on that. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. That's that, like Nonsense. that, you know, you can, you can cut it, you break it down like that and just be like, that, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Yeah. Raise it at parents night. Talk about it at parents night, but the government is going to enforce this. 
the cops are going to show up? Are you kidding me? No. What the fuck is that? Yeah, no. That is compelled speech, actually. Let's talk right. about that. Yeah. Do they believe in, uh, yeah, do they believe in free speech? Do they believe in rights? As- no. Of course not. <laughs> like, you you don't know 90% of the shit that happens in class because it's about, like, the fucking boring-ass book they're reading. Yeah. And you're going to start to try and find out what your teachers are calling your kids, like, they're prone. Who cares? <laughs> and the, and most most parents, as, and myself included, I don't know what the books they're reading are. <laughs> No, God, no, me neither. No, fuck. So, I, I, I don't want to know what's going on at school. I don't have time for that. No. They are doing school. I do home. That's the fucking division. Yeah. You know, I know that in an hour, I have to leave to get a rental car to bring my kid to his private fucking orthopedagogy classes because the schools don't have enough fucking support for him. That's right. what I know. And so that's the other thing too, right? Is it's like, what is this serving? Well, the schools are collapsing and violence is exploding inside of schools. Yeah. And so you're going to place a gender narc in every classroom. Right. That's going to help. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to oh. help. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Uh, to shift gears a little bit, uh, I know it's an old topic, but mm-hmm. uh, you've talked about how a uh, maid is not yeah. uh, the panacea of awesomeness and uh, d- disability rights. That <laughs> I don't know. State, is state suicide the answer? Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> So, Maybe that's yeah. where we're at. Yeah, I thought I thought I might get you to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So medical assistance in dying is um, a really interesting issue from a theoretical perspective. It's a really horrifying issue when you talk about it in practical terms. Uh, right. You know, since 2016, Canadians have had the right to request that their life be ended if the if the if the end of their life was reasonably foreseeable. And the definition of reasonably foreseeable is not, it's not defined, but through years of practice, there's certain kinds of benchmarks that, you, that a doctor might use or a medical professional might use to determine if something's reasonably foreseeable. Hmm. So the biggest change to healthcare policy during the pandemic happens in 2021 when the federal government is like, you know what? Death doesn't have to be reasonably foreseeable. If you have a grievous medical condition, that you could live for the next 60 years with, you can still ask the government to take your life. Right. So what that does is it means that suicide is only legal if you're disabled or chronically ill. Right. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, like the idea that you can end your life so you're not like on, you know, on a feeding tube and, and unconscious and your heart's not operating and your body's breaking down and your death is coming, like that's a kind of suicide, right? That's, right. that's, that's my life is about to end. And I want some level of control over when that happens, because frankly, I'm afraid. And if you look at the data, like suffering is not the most common reason for people choosing this. It's, it's other factors. Right. So most of it is like fear of getting worse, fear of pain, fear of being a burden actually is the biggest reason, which okay. is really sad. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. like, when you remove the end of life conversation, then it's just, I live with, you know, pain, like, in, incredible pain. Right. And it's like, oh, okay, but that pain isn't going to kill you, or the condition's not going to kill you, because your life is not reasonably foreseeably going to end. Right. And, and so then all of a sudden, you know, you've got, like, supports to manage pain, to have specialists, to have um, changes to your living environment. So you can live in your home, you can live like on your own terms, you can afford uh, attendance and other kinds of help. So you're not feeling like you're a burden on family and friends, like all of the things that would make someone living with pain and disability and illness more manageable. Or the government says, uh, actually, we'll just let you kill. You know, you can kill yourself. You can end your life. Right, right, yeah. And, and that's obviously, that's where we're at. yeah, like the uh, the amount of dollars it costs to have somebody mm. die is yeah. considerably like you're saving a lot of money in the yeah. in that way, right? That's the that's the worst part of it is you are saving a lot of money. People can see that. People can see that that's part of this equation, which is really yeah. gross. And, you know, like what I find is that the whole conversation is so dishonest because it's like, sorry, if someone wants to kill themselves in in Canadian society, 
they want to kill themselves because of something, right? Yep. No one, yep. no one is considering suicide. Who's like, you know, life is good, but <laughs> uh, I don't want to be I'm going out on a high note. <laughs> I'm going on a high note. I'm going to kill myself, right? That, that's not how this happens, right? So if that's not how it happens, someone who's con- contemplating suicide has some sort of grievance thing happening to them, yeah. whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's um, a, a, a something that has happened a, a externally to them and it's impacting them in serious ways. So either we make suicide legal, recognizing that there's going to be an, an extenuating circumstance that is making someone think about suicide, or we don't make suicide legal. And this is why I find this conversation so disingenuous because it's like, we, I mean, may, maybe there's people in society that want suicide to be, uh, assisted suicide to be made legal under any circumstances, but to do it in the way that they're doing it is literally giving this option to people who are disabled and chronically yeah. ill while able-bodied Canadians who already have, you know, access to services or don't need the supports as many, as many supports as the state, uh, don't have the right to take their lives. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's really fucked up. It's really fucked up. And, um, and this is like where the disability activist community has been so important helping to make people understand this, that, um, there was such a big shift in the conversation related to made thanks to that activism really Mm -hmm. uh, in a short period of time. Yeah. Cause, uh, I mean, I, I still like, I talk to like, uh, liberal progressives and, and they'll often talk about like the death and di- uh, die, dying with dignity dying with kind dignity. of thing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And you yep. go, well, but that's not what this is. Like people are almost being forced by the system into these, this is their only option. Yeah. <clears throat> no, exactly. And like dying with dignity uh, comes from a very uh, normative perspective where like people have the income to get the supports that they need and mm-hmm. everything is in place and they've still decided that they don't want to have an undignified death right it's like right. in their name yeah. i mean okay like you know it, it, if if we had if we had literally full supports full income supports full accessibility supports in people's homes for disabled people if we had full palliative care supports for people in canada if we didn't have institutionalization in long term care then i'd be like okay this is going to be a different conversation but right, we don't right. we don't have any of that stuff yeah cuz then you're giving people dignity in their life Yeah. Like, you know, (laughs) like no one wants to die in a horrifying way. And, um, and, and we know that institutionalized deaths are more likely to be horrifying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so rather than fixing them, we're just like, well, you can peace out earlier then. Right. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Not cool. No, it's not cool. Well, I guess uh, we're coming up close to an hour. So, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, where can people find you online? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the podcast is at Sandy and That's Sandy with a Y and you can find my website at Nora Uh, I am on Twitter and I, you know, I mean, Twitter is really annoying these days, but, uh, <laughs> somehow I'm still there. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still there. I'm no lore on Twitter N O L O R E. And, um, and yeah, that's where you can see like the random thoughts that enter my head. You haven't done uh, threads or blue sky or I'm on blue sky, but I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't (laughs) No, no, I find it clunky. I I find it hard to, I can't find anybody. Yeah. Uh, It's it's clearly still in development, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like people are following me and I'm like, do I follow them back? Like, I don't even know. Right. And anyway, so I'm on blue sky, but I'm not loving it. Not yet. Fair. No, that's fair. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for your time and have a good one. Yeah, you too. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. 
If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.